So let's continue with our discussion of Newton's uh, laws and application of forces. So what you should be seeing uh, right now on the screen is kind of the topic of the next discussion. Uh, I've got this cute little kitty cat and uh, he's, he's saying mew. Uh, it may not look like mew, but that's what that is. Mu is a Greek letter that we use for a concept that's really kind of important to us in physics uh, called friction. Uh, friction is going to be another of those forces that we're going to have to account for uh, in these free body diagrams when we start doing some of the forces problems uh, like we saw last time. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about friction and talk about what it is going to talk about how to calculate it, and then we're going to do a problem or two on the whiteboard uh, where I'm going to show you how to incorporate it. Uh, before I start with that, I will say that I have uh, posted all the grades up on Blackboard, so it should be current up to this point. Uh, the I have moved the homework assignment that was supposed to be due this week, uh, moved it out to do next week, uh, Friday at midnight, and that's going to be the homework that's going to cover what we're into right now, which is the summing the forces problems, inclined planes, that kind of thing. Uh, I've also scheduled for the next, I don't know, couple of weeks out, kind of preliminarily what the homeworks are going to look like. Uh, I lost about a week here uh, because last Friday you guys were supposed to be working on the test and I screwed that one up with the way I configured it. Uh, so you guys effectively lost that day, and Monday, having been President's Day and a federal holiday, I decided that it was not fair to have you guys just lose that day. And because it was a federal holiday, and I figured a lot of you guys were off work, I'd just give you an extra day to work on it. Uh, so we should be caught up now. That's okay. Uh, it just means that I'm going to have to push things back by a week. It's not a big deal. So... Uh, and having looked at homework assignments and tests, most of you are doing very well, doing exactly what I expect you to be doing. As you saw, the test came directly from the homework assignments. And so there's a high correlation with people that did the homeworks and did well in the homeworks with people that did well on the tests. If you're one of those people that are not doing so great in one of those areas, then you need to either consider coming and talk to me or if the course load is too overwhelming, you might want to consider dropping this and taking it again another uh, semester or two because it's not going to get any easier from here out. All right. Having said that, let's get back to our discussion of cats because I love cats. Uh, we're going to talk about, like I said, this little kitten and his mew. So let me switch back over to the whiteboard you should be seeing now. So what is friction? Friction is something that is, it's a word that you have heard. It's a word that you've looked at before, but you probably haven't given it a whole lot of thought. as to what that really means. So friction itself is a force, first of all. So friction itself is a force. That means because it is a force, then we're gonna need to account for it In Newton's second law, a lot of times I'll abbreviate Newton's second law as N2L. So we're going to have to account for this in Newton's second law. Remember, Newton's second law says the sum of the forces in any system is proportional to the total mass of the system and the total acceleration experienced by that system. 
And in order to get this, what we've had to do is we've had to look at this sum of the forces. So if we'll take a look at our inclined plane problem that we did last time. We have a mass, some box, some spherical cow. It is on a ramp with some angle theta. The theta is between whatever we're gonna call our horizontal uh, and the surface of the ramp. Remember, we can pick whatever coordinate system we want because we're physicists and we're lazy. And ultimately what we're trying to do in this example is we know just by looking at this, we can tell that the box is gonna slide down the ramp because of gravity, right? Gravity is pulling this thing down. The box is going to slide down the ramp. And remember, the way that we did that is we had to generate a coordinate system that made sense. So we made a coordinate system that was tilted in a way that one of our axes aligns with the direction of motion. If we were to try to do this with a traditional coordinate system with the y-axis being vertical and the x-axis being horizontal, you could do the problem. Everything would work out just fine, but you would cause yourself a whole lot of problems because of the whole lot of extra math that you're gonna to have to account for. So what we're gonna do in order to eliminate a lot of that extra work is we're gonna set a coordinate system that is convenient. The easiest way to do it is to set your coordinates where one of the axes is aligned with the direction of motion. Notice I say one of the axes. Notice I did not label this as X or Y. I've just made an arbitrary system. So you can easily call up and down the hill the Y axis and kind of perpendicular to the box as the x-axis if you wanted to. It doesn't matter. But for now, just because it makes sense to me, I'm going to call the axis that's aligned with the ramp the x-axis and the axis that is perpendicular or normal to the ramp to be the y-axis. You might not have heard that term before. Normal to the ramp. In geometry, normal means perpendicular. It means the same thing in physics, except remember we have a force that's called the normal force. So if you remember the normal force is that Newton's third law force. It's that thing, it's that force where the box is pushing against the ramp but the, box, the ramp has to push back against the box. Those two must be equal. We know the box pushing on the ramp is because of its weight, which is a function of gravity. But if that was the only force, it would fall through the ramp. So the ramp has to push back. And that force is equal and opposite to the weight force. But because of the way we've drawn this, that force is perpendicular to our direction of motion. That is what we call the normal force. So remember in geometry, a perpendicular line is a, it is normal. Those vectors are normal to each other. Sometimes you'll hear about normalizing vectors. That's what that means. So that's where we get the term normal force. So the next thing we did here is we had to kind of align we had to figure out what our forces were. So if we look, we notice that we must have some force that's the weight of this box has to be acting directly down, right? From our perspective. Well, we also notice that this conveniently makes 
another right angle. We would expand this out. So we can do some trig and we can find out then that the normal force, which remember has got to be perpendicular here, is the sine of that angle times the weight. If you don't remember how to do that, I recommend going back and review your trig functions, uh, that which one's which. Well, that means that since there's that component, that normal force, there's got to be another force, this green arrow here, that's got to be normal to the y. So that piece of it, if this piece was the sine, then that force, whatever it is, has got to be equal to the cosine of that weight. So that's all we did. If we apply that to Newton's law, we can say that the green forces are the x direction and the orange forces are, yeah, I guess orange we would call the y direction. So in the x direction, we have this, whatever this force is, F. In the y direction, we have just this normal force. Remember, both of those are a function of this angle and a function of the weight. So then when we go in here to our sum of forces, sum of the forces is equal to all the forces in the x direction plus all the forces in the y direction. That still has to be equal to the total mass of the system times acceleration. All of our x forces are F. When I say x forces, I mean the forces in the x direction, not the superhero team with Deadpool and Cable. Uh, so, this is our forces in the x direction. In this case, the forces in the y direction are just the normal force. And that still has to equal MA. And from there, we can start turning it into what we already know about acceleration and velocities and directions and distances and that kind of thing. So, this is what we did last time. If you think about this problem, think about this in the real world. If I have a ramp, I put a brick box or something on that ramp, and I start tilting that ramp. Let's say I start where it's just completely level with the ground, and I start tilting that ramp. In fact, let me do a little classroom demonstration here. And so here I have a box. Okay, this box has some mass. I don't know what it is. I don't care. I just know that it has a mass. It sits in my hand. And my hand is perpendicular or parallel to the ground. That box is not going anywhere. If I change the angle, in other words, I'm increasing theta, I'm doing just this, I increase the theta, the box doesn't move until, once my angle becomes steep enough, that thing's going to fall. It's going to start sliding off with my hand. If I wanted to be able to hold on to that box at a higher angle, in other words, I want to make sure that this thing doesn't slide off until I'm up here somewhere, then what I have to do is find a way to make this thing stick to my hand a little bit better. There's two ways I can do that. 
The first way is by increasing the mass of the box. If this was not a box of face masks, if this was, say, a box of gold bricks, the gold bricks obviously would weigh much, much more. And it would make it would take more angle to make that thing slide off. That kind of makes sense. That's kind of intuitive to us. The other thing I can do would be to somehow create a different surface. If instead of just taking my bare hand and this box, what if I covered my hand in, I don't know, peanut butter? So peanut butter is gonna be really sticky, right? Well, that's gonna cause this to hold on even more. You'll see this if you watch like football. Uh, a lot of times the receivers for the football team will either wear gloves or they will put some sort of resin or something on their hands that makes it sticky. And that way they can hold on to the ball a little bit better when they catch it. The other thing I could do is if I coated my hand in something like Vaseline, it would feel gross, but it would make my hand really slippery and it wouldn't take as much for this thing to leave my hand. So there must then be in addition to this dependence on the angle theta, there must be some dependence on how the two surfaces interact with each other. How those surfaces interact with each other, I know you think I'm about to say friction, but I'm not. How those surfaces interact with each other is characterized by something called the coefficient of friction. And that's where we use that Greek letter mu. The coefficient of friction is a unitless measurement that tells us kind of the stickiness of the surface. So remember, it's unitless. It's not given in meters, it's not given in kilograms, it's not given in kilograms per meter, any of that. It's a unitless value. It is just a coefficient. It is typically, between zero and one. Notice I'm using decimal notation here. The reason for this is if the value is typically between zero and one, then that means all the time, or most of the time, most of the things we're gonna do, this value is gonna be something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, something like that. If you want to kind of think about this as an equivalence to something else, this unitless thing, that's what sine, cosine, and tangent of angles give you. They give you something unitless. Remember, we talked about thinking about those trig functions in terms of being the percentage of the force applied in that direction because of that angle. Thus, our sine and cosine functions tend to go between zero and one, right? None of it in that direction or all of it in that direction. Think of these as percentages. So zero would be 0%, 1.0 is 100%. So the coefficient of friction typically is a value between zero and one. That's unitless, it's usually a decimal value. And it's an indication of how sticky that surface is. If you want to think of what that really means, think about zero, coefficient of friction of zero. We're going to make this closer to ice. And coefficient of 100, that might go to 
something like hot tar on a street or something. Now, those are not actual values, but for our purposes, it gives you kind of a general idea of what this is. So the less sticky a substance is, the closer its coefficient of friction is going to be to zero. And the stickier it is, or the more it resists motion, is going to be closer to one. Uh, let me see if I can look up some typical values for coefficient of friction. There are tables and tables and tables of this. For lots of different engineering applications, you might need to know about different values. So let me go, yeah. So uh, I've got a table here and let's say that we're looking at, uh, let's see, that's a good one. Aluminum on steel. So I have an aluminum box on a steel floor. They're both metals, but they're dissimilar metals. So aluminum on steel, according to this value, is a coefficient of friction of 0 0.61. And you might say, well, okay, cool. But what happens if I make that wet? Well, uh, I don't have a value for that one, but I do have brass on steel. According to this chart, the coefficient of brass on steel when it's dry is 0 0.5. And when it's wet, it's 0 0.19. So those two metals, if you have water between them, makes them a lot more slippery. This starts to make some sense when you think about the performance of your car tires, for example, uh, on the rain, or on ice and snow. Normally, your coefficient of friction between your rubber tire and the asphalt or the concrete of the road is going to be relatively high. As soon as we put some other surface in there, some water, some ice, some snow, whatever it is, we're going to start decreasing the coefficient of friction. So why do we care? What are we going to do with this information? We know that the coefficient of friction has to do with resisting motion. That in and of itself is a clue about how we're going to apply this. Remember, this coefficient of friction is not a force. If it's not a force, then we cannot just plug it into the equation here. We're not going to have our forces in the x direction plus our forces in the y direction plus mu. That's not going to work. Mu, notice, is almost always positive. So if we just add another value, no matter how small, then that's going to give us an imbalance of the forces. That's not what we want. We need another force that opposes the direction of motion. Well, that new force is friction. So if we update our diagram here a little bit, and we add another force, in the negative green direction, that is going to be our frictional force. 
Notice I generally write friction as a lowercase f. Sometimes I'll write it as an uppercase f uh, with a lowercase f subscript, the force due to friction. Doesn't really matter as long as you know what it is. But remember, that's the force. The coefficient of friction itself is not the force. The coefficient of friction has to do with the interaction of the surfaces. If we go back to my example of the box, and I'm gonna tilt this and it's gonna slide. I started this discussion by going, well, okay, what can I do to fix that? And we talked about making the surface really slippery or really sticky. So we're doing, we're changing the coefficient of friction. The other thing we can do is to change the mass. So this force due to friction that we have must be, so we call this lowercase f, this force due to friction must be a function of the coefficient of friction, mu, and the weight force. But it can't be all of the weight force. It's just the weight force that is uh, normal. Plane of motion. Remember, coefficient of friction is how slippery these things are. The frictional force itself is a function of how slippery it is and how hard those things are pressing together. In our example of the box here, the things are only pressing together in what we've called our y-axis. The surface and the box are not pressing against each other in the x direction. So we only have to worry about the weight force that is normal to our motion. We already have a word for that, the weight force that is normal to the motion. That is the normal force. So that means that our force due to friction is the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Well, we can update our chart here. We now have another force in what we're calling the X direction. That force is the force due to friction. So we've just added some stuff, right? Well, now, if we go back to our Newton's second law equation, let's take our forces in the x direction. So we go to our chart, or we can just look at our diagram. Look how helpful these diagrams are. Many of you started to see this on the last test and on the homework assignments, that if you draw diagrams like this, suddenly your life becomes exponentially easier. Also notice what I did, and it just kind of felt natural. I didn't even really think about this when I set the problem up. Notice what I said my positive direction was. My positive direction is down the hill. So what? Remember, the positive and negative signs in our physics equations only mean direction. There was a problem that was frequently missed on the exam the other day that had to do with a bird flying into the wind and you had to calculate its velocity or something. The most common thing that was missed on that was the sign. I think your value should have been negative. Most people did the magnitude correctly, but forgot the sign and listed it as positive. The only thing the sign means is direction. So we can pick whatever direction we want 
to be our positive direction. In this case, we have chosen down the hill to be the positive direction. So we've said that force is just capital F. So we can now say that the forces in the X direction are just our capital F. Remember, we're summing the forces. That uppercase sigma just means add or sum. So the other force that we have in that direction is this force due to friction. But remember, we need to account for the direction because the force due to friction always opposes the direction of motion or the applied force, as we're going to get into in a minute, or probably next lecture. The force due to friction always opposes the direction of motion. And if we chose our direction of motion to be positive, then that means our force due to friction must be negative. Had we chosen down the hill to be the negative direction, then we just say negative capital F plus a lowercase f. Doesn't matter as long as the signs are right and consistent. So that's our forces in the x direction. Notice our forces in the y direction did not change. They're still the normal force. And we didn't change the right side of the equation, meaning we did not add or subtract to the mass of this box. Since that stayed the same, the total force in the system had to stay the same, MA. Otherwise, we violated all kinds of laws of physics, probably ripped a hole in space-time, and the doctor is going to be angry. And if you don't know who the doctor is, I highly recommend going to BBC and doing a search for Doctor Who. So now we've just added another force. Notice what we did did not fundamentally change the problem. The fundamentals of the problem are still the same. We have a box on a hill, and the box is going to slide down the hill. When we did that problem before, one of the things I assumed was no friction. But it still worked out the same way. Let's do a quick exercise and let's prove that if we discount friction, this equation still works. So if we assume there is no friction, meaning there is no resistance between the box and the hill, well, this big F, that force applied as the box goes down the hill does not change. The normal force does not change because that's only a function of the angle and the weight of the box. The only thing that changes is the force due to friction. And we said that was zero. We assumed it was zero. So how are we going to force mu n to zero. Well, I replace lowercase f with zero. There is no frictional force. Well, mu n still has to be true. This is still a force. This must still be true. So let's think about what these values represent. N is the normal force. Remember, the normal force, I should probably write this down somewhere. Here it is. And remember the weight. Is the mass of the box times the acceleration due to gravity? Or MA? Oh, weight's a force too, isn't it? So, since the weight is not going to change, right? Because we're not doing anything to the mass of the box. There, this is not a box full of kittens where the kittens are leaping out of the boxes. The thing slides down the hill. 
the mass is going to stay the same. The acceleration due to gravity is going to stay the same. Dr. J. Yes. Um, I have to go to my um, immunology lab. Oh, okay. Okay, I just want to let you know. No, no, that's fine. Uh, this thing will get posted on the YouTube channel here in probably 30 minutes or an hour or so. Okay, great, thanks. No problem. So, we have this function, this thing that's mu n. We know our normal force is only a function of the angle and a function of the weight. We're not changing the angle. We're not changing the mass of the box. We're not changing the acceleration due to gravity. Now we're gonna find, once we get into the next section and we start talking about energy, we're gonna find that the acceleration due to gravity can change based on the distance you are from the center of mass. So in reality, the acceleration due to gravity experienced by this box because of the Earth does change a little bit as we go down the hill. However, that is a very, very small amount. It's on the order of 15 or 20 decimal places. And so we don't care. That only starts to matter if we start to get distances that are like halfway between here and the moon. Then the acceleration due to gravity because of the mass of the Earth is going to start dropping off as we get further from the planet. Everything we're doing here, we're effectively on the surface of the Earth. So there is no effective change in the acceleration due to gravity. So Mg or the weight, still must be some positive value. Theta, there's only one restriction on theta. Theta cannot be 90 degrees. If theta is 90, then sine goes to zero. And so the thing's in free fall, and it doesn't matter if it's not touching the thing or not. Well, we've clearly drawn this such that that's not the case. So our sine theta, remember, is a unitless value that represents kind of the percentage of that force in that direction. So that's got to be a positive value. So N, therefore, if the box exists, then N must exist. So N must be positive. So if we have zero, then it'll be just rearrange this formula and we get mu equals zero over n. So long as n is positive, n could even be negative in this case, right? As long as it ain't zero, zero divided by anything is zero. So that means our coefficient of friction must be zero. If we go back to this equation and we're summing our forces, the frictional force, remember, is mu n. If mu is zero, then that implies the frictional force is zero. This goes away, and we just have F plus n equals ma, just like we did the other day. So it doesn't really matter what that normal force is. But if we have friction, then we have to account for it. This equation, I showed you a special case first. Let me show you something even more useful. We can rearrange this equation to get this. Mu is the force of friction divided by the normal force. That's incredibly useful. Remember I showed you that you can look up different coefficients of friction between different materials. This is very important in engineering calculations. 
for example, if I want to build a system of gears, I'd kind of like to know what the coefficient of friction between the teeth of the gears are, because that's going to affect how quickly those gears turn and how much energy I need. But I generally, I'm not going to have a chart for that. Generally, I'm going to have to determine it experimentally. And I think you're going to do this in the lab if you haven't done so already. What we're going to have to do is find the coefficient of friction for a system. Well, how would we do that? Experimentally, what we're going to do is we're going to take some mass and we're going to create some ramp. And we're going to measure the angle and we're going to measure the mass of the box at different angles. So how does that help us? We need to consider what's happening here in a physics, from a physics standpoint. As long as the force due to friction is equal to or greater than this applied force, there is no motion. So we have to find the point at which those two forces, the force due to friction and our applied force are equal. So let's just do that real quick. Symbolically, anyway, if we set what we're calling our applied force, capital F in green, equal to our force due to friction in green, well, let's do some math. We know that that applied force is cos theta times the weight, which is mg. We know the force due to friction is mu times the normal force. Mu, you don't know, right? The normal force is sine theta times the weight, which is mg. Be careful. We cannot just cancel the mg here. Because remember, cosine theta, sine theta are kind of unitless things. But we can rearrange this a little bit. And we can say that cos theta mg over sine theta mg, it's the same thing, right? That gives our coefficient of friction. So if we're doing this in the lab and we have a box on a ramp and we tilt the ramp, we know the mass of the box, right? We can put that on a scale. We know this angle because we can measure that with a protractor. We know the acceleration due to gravity because we're on Earth. Well, look, we have everything we need, right? We tilt the ramp until the box moves. When the box moves, we know this must be true, that the applied force has got it equal to the force due to friction. We know theta, we know M, we know G. We plug those in, out pops the coefficient of friction. If you don't believe this, what is cosine divided by sine? It's another trig function, just a ratio. So it means since coefficient of friction is a unitless value, then whatever this is, this cosine of some number over the sine of some number had better be a unitless value. And we know for a fact that that's true because these are trig functions. So we're operating on some number and taking a cosine of it, cosine theta of it, we're taking a sine theta of the same number, we better get a unitless value out of that. So unitless value 
divided by unitless value gives us some other unitless value, which is in fact the coefficient of friction. How does that help us? Well, let's take it a step further. Let's say that I know this box is made of tungsten. And I want to know what that surface is. Well, I need to know what that surface is. And if I know the coefficient of friction and I know one of the materials, that's when I go into a table and I can look up, okay, what is a coefficient of friction between tungsten and other material that equals whatever mu I calculated was. Using those tables, if we can get close enough and get accurate enough tables, we can tell experimentally what this ramp is made of. Very interesting. So these are the kind of things we're gonna do. I'm gonna stop there for today. Uh, because it's important that we understand what friction is, where it comes from, the difference between the force due to friction and the coefficient of friction. And when we come in here to the next lecture, uh, we're going to start looking at specific problems, putting all this together. Going to give you some real world things. We're going to calculate some things. We're actually going to throw some numbers into this thing. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to work these kind of problems. The reason I'm spending so much time on this is because guess what the next homework predominantly consists of? These kind of problems. Very, very simple. Okay. So that is all I have for today. As always, if you need help, send me an email. Come find me in my office. The University Tutoring Center also has a couple of our physics grad students and some of our senior level undergrad students are around usually to help you out if you're scared of me for some reason. Um, keep plugging at it and keep doing what you're doing and you'll be fine. I will see you guys in the next lecture.